A person can be creative in composing music, in painting a portrait, doing mathematics, devising a solution to a political problem, or decorating a home. Can they also be creative in the way they lead their lives? I don't think there's any obvious reason to think not. Indeed, one might think that this, this sort of creativity is a crucial part of human flourishing. You know, this kind of originality in living has received little attention from philosophers. With few notable exceptions, little has been said, for example, about what exactly this quality consists in, whether, why, and how it is valuable, and what its relationship to the demands of morality, rationality, and prudence are. One way into these questions is through the consideration of individuals who exhibit this quality of ethical creativity to an extraordinary degree. I call these people ethical geniuses. So let's start off by saying something about what an ethical genius is. Since I've described this as a person who is extraordinarily creative in how they live their life, I think a reasonable starting point is with a comparison with artistic genius. And to do this, I want to talk a little bit about two artists. The first is this guy, Lawrence Alma Tadema, who is one of the most technically skilled draftsmen of the second half of the 19th century. He's best known for his depictions of classical decadence and romance set against palatial interiors and azure skies. His works possess all the qualities prized by academic painting of that era, a consistent hierarchy of organization within the visual field, systematic variations of hue and contrast that reinforces that hierarchy, dramatic depth of perspective, as in this painting especially, figures arranged in dramatic poses, um, and sumptuous colors. So in one sense, Alma Tadema was a very good artist. But in another, he was quite mediocre. His paintings are unchallenging, derivative, and pretty uninventive. It's for this reason that Ruskin famously, though maybe a little unfairly, called Alma Tadema the worst painter of the 19th century. The limitations of Alma Tadema as an artist are especially obvious when we compare his work to his almost exact contemporary, Paul Cezanne. Where Alma Tadema relied on staid and traditional uh, depictive schemes, Cezanne challenged the most fundamental aspects of those schemes. Where Alma Tadema's work was, seems vaguely familiar, even on first inspection, Cezanne's offers a new way of seeing both art and the world. Where Alma Tadema's work looks in retrospect like a visual dead end, Cezanne's points the way to fauvism, cubism, and more distant forms of the avant-garde. So here bunch of Cezanne. And we'll just leave that the long sans victoire. The crucial difference between Cezanne and Alma Tadema are captured rather well by Kant's theory of genius, I think. And it's worth fleshing out the comparison with that theory. One of the goals of Kant's aesthetics is reconciling two ideas the neoclassical idea that art must in some sense be, subject, be subject, subject to rules of production and appreciation, and the romantic ideal that good art somehow transcends all these rules. His theory of genius is one aspect of this effort. In deference to the second goal, he says that the primary characteristic of genius is originality, for genius is entirely opposed to the spirit of imitation. It is a talent for producing that which is for which no determinate rule can be given, and therefore not a predisposition of skill for with that which can be learned in accordance with some rule. For this reason, even the greatest facility for learning does not qualify as genius. But in keeping with the neoclassical idea, he says that originality does not guarantee genius. Because there can be original nonsense. The products of genius must somehow instantiate some form of order, coherence, or intelligibility. Otherwise, they would just be indistinguishable from gibberish. In particular, the products of genius must at the same time be models for other people. They must be exemplary. While not themselves the result of imitation, they must yet serve others in this way, i.e., as a standard for, or a rule for judging. What Kant means, it seems, is that even though works of genius are not produced by following an antecedent system of rules, they cannot, therefore, be anomalous. They must be exemplary of something rule-like. We can think of Kant's originality criterion, I think, in terms of the violation of implicit rules of production and appreciation. For a given community, we could think of there being a set of rules, P, 
of artistic production that are recognized as constituting admissible ways of producing art. And we can think of there being a set of rules A that govern an audience's appreciation of that work of art. The sets P and A obviously exist in homeostasis. Originality relative to a particular community, then, will consist in artistic production that cannot be captured by the rules in P and whose product is plainly not suitable to appreciation according to rules in A. Such is the case with Cezanne. He flouts academic con conventions for establishing harmony and unity to the canvas observed even by Impressionists. He paints parts that oftentimes do not add up to holes. This is pretty evident there and also in the view from Lestock. Um, uh, he uses hues too uniform to differentiate objects and bathes his paintings in light that is too uniform and resists the impulse to find depth and perspective. These effects frustrate our ability to make sense of the paintings in the usual ways. And the fact that these rules and expectations are amongst the most basic and pervasive ones we have for appreciating art makes, these, makes this originality considerable. A feature of genius closely related to the previous one is the appearance of spontaneity. If we cannot understand a work of art as produced by some familiar rules, it will have the appearance of being produced not by calculation or planning, but unconsciously, unintentionally, of something guided not by a recipe, but by inspiration. Roger Fry, famous critic Roger Fry, is particularly taken with this feature of Cezanne. His work, Fry says, has the baffling, mysterious quality of the greatest originators of art. It has that supreme spontaneity, as though it had almost made himself, as though he had almost made himself passive, half-conscious instrument of some directing power. So it all seems implied at first sight in his apparently accidental co-location of form and color. So much reveals itself gradually to the fascinated gaze. Now, in a certain sense, originality and spontaneity are easy. You can just set out to break the rules instead of following them. You can thrash about randomly. The result of this kind of practice, however, is likely to be what Kant calls nonsense. Um, so I don't know how helpful this is. I went looking for art that seemed to be nonsense to me. This is from the Museum of Bad Art. Um, this is a Damien Hirst piece. So you might, there might be some disagreement as to whether that's nonsense. It's a skull covered in diamonds. Um, so, but what distinguishes genius and nonsense, aesthetically speaking? One answer is that nonsense appears arbitrary, and for this reason lacks the power to draw us in and engage us. Cezanne's painting feels spontaneous, almost accidental, Fry says, but our gaze is nonetheless fascinated. Not so with nonsense. The haphazard violation of rules is no more interesting than slavish adherence to them. If we as viewers feel that there is no sense or intelligence behind the novelty, then we also have the sense that our engagement is unlikely to prove fruitful, and so we're unmoved. This is why television static or spilled milk, or this from, for me anyway, are inapt to elicit aesthetic responses, even if they are, in some sense, highly original. The originality that characterizes genius is quite the opposite. It captivates us, even if, it cannot make se even if we cannot make sense of it in the usual ways we experience as a sort of thing that is suitable for attention and reflection. Even if it isn't intelligible, it comes with a promise of intelligibility. Merleau-Ponty's well-known essay on Cezanne is a good illustration of this point. According to Merleau-Ponty, Cezanne is interested in rejecting ready-made alternatives. Sensation versus judgment, the painter who sees against the painter who thinks, nature versus composition, primitivism as opposed to tradition. To this end, Cezanne did not think that he had to choose between feeling and thought, as if he were deciding between chaos and order. He did not want to separate the stable things which we see and the shifting way in which they appear. He wanted to depict matter as it takes on form, the birth of order through spontaneous organization. Cezanne wanted to paint a primordial world, and his pictures therefore seemed to show nature pure, but never wished to paint like a savage. He wanted to put intelligence, ideas, sciences, perspective, and tradition back in touch with the world of nature. So these four marks are highly synoptic, but they give us a sense of the intelligibility that Cezanne's paintings may promise, despite their strangeness. If Merleau-Ponty is right, it is an intelligibility rooted in a return to a primordial way of seeing that overcomes spurious dichotomies. <laughs> 
Insofar as the paintings do encourage this kind of primordial scene, we are drawn into them as we try to see them as they see are fit to be seen. Now Kant also says, I've mentioned before, that the, the genius is the capacity whereby nature gives the rule to art. I don't know what that means exactly. No one knows what that means exactly. Um, but here's one idea. Um, a work of genius, while evidently not produced by the rules in some uh, battery of rules of production and resisting interpretation by standard interpretive rules, nonetheless exemplifies some further rules that can serve as a standard or rule for judging. This feature is, of course, closely related to the previous one. The intelligibility that a work promises is usually, if not always, tied to the scheme that it exemplifies. Frequently, this exemplification works in a particular way. A work of genius exemplifies these rules by exhibiting some harmony, coherence, order, or organic unity that is not codifiable by our usual rules, by the old rules. The originality of a work of art would consist then in the exemplification of this novel form of harmony, a harmony that can be subsequently described with a set of rules. A promise of intelligibility would likewise consist in the vague recognition of this harmony or order. I cannot understand this work using my usual rules, but because I can recognize some order to the piece, I feel that there must be some sense to it. Once more, Fry's criticism is on point. At first sight, Cezanne's paintings look accidental, and yet the longer one looks, the more satisfactory are the correspondences one discovers. The more carefully felt beneath its subtlety is the architectural plan. The more absolute, in spite of their astounding novelty, do we find the color harmonies. So despite this strangeness, Cezanne's paintings exemplify a special and difficult form of harmony. And the faint recognition of this harmony, it seems, is largely responsible for the magnetism of the paintings. Okay, so I've taken a while to suggest four overlapping features of artistic genius. Two are negative, originality and spontaneity bespeak an absence of rule guidedness. And two are positive, the promise of intelligibility and exemplarity suggests a vague rule-ishness. With this explication in hand, let's return to our original question. Can we conceive of individuals whose lives exhibit these properties? We are after individuals whose lives break our standard rules of production and interpretation and do so with the appearance of spontaneity, but who also live in a way that seems to offer a promise of intelligibility premised on a novel system of rules that that life exemplifies. Who might that be? So let's cut to the chase. Uh, Socrates, Abraham, Diogenes the dog, Jesus, Francis of Assisi, Israel ben Eliezer, Toussaint Louverture, Henry David Thoreau, Jane Addams, Gandhi. These are individuals I will not talk about today, but may nonetheless uh, be defended as, as ethical geniuses, and I do this elsewhere in the project. The person I want to talk about today is someone who's already come up a couple times at this conference, and that's Simone Weil. Uh, I want to suggest that Simone Weil is an ethical genius, and that her life um, uh, exemplifies the same sorts of qualities as a painting uh, by Cezanne. So it's difficult to summarize Vey's life, but I need to do a little bit here. Um, so here are the basics. She was born in 1909 to an upper middle class family of assimilated Jews in Paris. She was precocious as a child, but overshadowed by her prodigy brother. As a child, she was obsessed with cleanliness, she was exceptionally empathic, and she was disdainful of her womanhood. She adopted ideals of purity and asceticism early on and pursued them with fanatical devotion. She later went on to the Ecole Normale where she excelled despite frustrating her teachers and subsequently became a lycée teacher in the provinces. At this time, her eccentricities intensified and she became active in radical labor movements. Despite fragile health, she elected to work incognito in factories for two years so that she could understand the rigors of factory labor. She then went to Spain during the Civil War, where she attempted to sacrifice herself to the Republican cause, only to be sent away by her commanders. After returning to France, she became interested in religion, especially Catholicism. At this time, she began to have mystical epiphanic experiences, and her health began to deteriorate. After the capitulation of France in the war, she lived briefly in New York before going to London to work for the Free French Forces. She wanted to be sent to the continent, but was turned away by her superiors because of her poor health and lack of qualifications for covert missions. She died in 1943 of some combination of tuberculosis and the starvation rations she imposed upon herself. 
She wrote throughout her life, but her books only became widely read after her death. So I want to say that Vey is an ethical genius, that her life exhibits those same qualities that are characteristics of Cezanne's paintings. Now, I'm not alone in making this kind of attribution. Uh, one biographer says, Simone Vey is a moral genius in the orbit of ethics, a genius of immense revolutionary range. By reviving the inward quest of man in history, she has discovered the key to a wisdom which can be applied to the daily life of every man on both the individual and social plane. And T.S. Eliot, who wrote a preface to one of her books, urged readers to expose themselves to the personality of a woman of genius, of a kind of genius akin to that of saints. Camus said that she's the only great spirit of our age. Now, to fully vindicate these kinds of claims, we would need to do something akin to artistic criticism of her life, a patient and exacting discussion of the aesthetic effects of features of that life. Today, we'll have to settle for a hopelessly adumbrated version of that. The first thing to note about Vey is that she was a deeply strange person. And by deeply, I don't just mean very. She failed to confirm to most of the norms of manners, dress, speech, food, and so on. But she wasn't so much flouting those norms as walking right past them while living out some unorthodox implementation of an extreme version of a very earnest ideal of purity or asceticism or selflessness or patriotism. At times, this tendency seemed to reflect an extraordinary intelligence. At others, abnormality, but usually both. Vey's life frustrates her usual categories of interpretation. There's a temptation to assimilate her life to familiar interpretive paradigms, to see her as a person imitating the lives of saints, or as a failed revolutionary who retreats to philosophy, or of a certain kind of self-destructive person, or of a person of affected eccentricity. But ultimately, none of these categories fit. Vey is something different from all of these sorts of people. And she's deeply out of step with our usual way of understanding how lives go. And yet her life is not something lived arbitrarily, nor is it something that we feel must be beyond our understanding. This, of course, I'm reporting my own um, reactions, but I think they're fairly widely shared. Um, her life makes what I earlier called a promise of intelligibility. The promise is rooted in a conviction that Vey's life is, to quote another biographer, shaped into a coherent design and guided by a precise inspiration. Even if we might question her decision to go to Spain or work in a factory or starve herself, and even if we cannot offer a traditional rationalizing explanation for these decisions, we have the sense that Vey has an identity in terms of which these decisions make sense and around which a coherent narrative could, in principle, be constructed. This will be a narrative in which contradictions are synthesized, just as Merleau-Ponty suggests about Cezanne. For example, Eliot observes that Vey is at once more devoted to the well-being of the downtrodden than most of those who call themselves socialist, but more committed to traditional structures than those who call themselves conservatives. And yet somehow she is able to embrace both of these ideals, seamlessly and without distortion. More generally, Vey is, as the same biographer says, a person who unites the most scrupulous commitment with the greatest openness, who, who synthesizes in her practice the manifold contributions of her watchful, subtle, and analytic sensibility. So this is the quick and far too dirty case for Vey's ethical genius. Her life challenges us by frustrating our usual way of interpreting lives, and yet we feel that it exemplifies some order and harmony, some coherent identity, and so offers a promise of intelligibility. Now, Vey's life also witnesses another important point. Ethical geniuses need not be morally perfect. Vey does score high on many traditional rubrics of morality, especially ones related to fellow feeling and self-sacrifice, but she's deficient in others. She's neither prudent, temperate, nor really courageous. And she has a number of moral opinions that I at least think are outlandish. So ethical genius definitely does not entail high marks on all our rubrics of a moral evaluation. And prima facie, the entailment shouldn't go in the other direction either. One can be a moral saint and still be quite uncreative. Given that ethical genius does not guarantee virtue, we might wonder then why we should care about the category of ethical genius at all. Well, here's where I pivot to throw up three theses that I defend in the project. And um, so here are three reasons to care about the category. 
Three things I defend. A kind of Nietzschean thesis. Ethical genius is an intrinsic good. By that I mean living a life of ethical genius, ceteris paribus, makes one's life go better. The not really argument, well, there is an argument, it's not there. It has to do with the competing demands of intelligibility and autonomy. A kind of million thesis. So the ethical genius is an epistemic good. That ethical geniuses live in a way that can make important practical facts accessible that would otherwise be obscure. And the last thesis is what I call a kind of Shaftesbarian thesis. Ethical genius is an aesthetic good. The lives and characters of ethical geniuses are beautiful. So I can't talk about all three of these, obviously. And because of the way I've introduced ethical genius, uh, what makes the most sense is to me to talk about the last of these, the kind of Shaftesbarian thesis. So let's do that. I'm going to transition into focusing a little more narrowly on the aesthetic features of ethical genius. So what I want to say intersects with an old thesis about the connection between virtue and beauty. Um, Plotinus says that the beauties of right living are more lofty than the beauties of sense, and that the face of justice is beyond the beauty of evening or morning star. Centuries later, Shaftesbury says something similar, that virtue can be beautiful, and that the pleasure we take in this beauty is an important motivation to become virtuous. Similarly, Hutchison says that the author of nature has made virtue a lovely form to excite our pursuit of it. Hume, likewise, is apt to talk about moral beauty, and Reed says that we may justly ascribe beauty to those qualities which are natural objects of love and kind affection, a category which he says includes the moral virtues. All these quotes suggest a view we might call the moral view, beauty view, which says, a quality of character is morally good if and only if it is beautiful. Might mention, so everyone needs to mention Linda Zagzebski's book. She doesn't really defend this view, but she does use the phrase moral beauty in that book, so the view might presuppose the moral beauty view. Um, so this view has some obvious appeal and some obvious problems. For this venue, it's worth noting some particular consequences of the thesis for people interested in moral exemplars. First, it may give us a way to identify such exemplars. For if the view is true, then the morally best people should be those whose characters arouse the strongest or purest or most intense experiences of beauty. Second, we may hope that people are motivated to be morally better through the consideration of moral exemplars. The moral beauty view offers a potential source for this motivation in the aesthetic pleasure derived from aesthetic contemplation. Third, we may hope that we can learn how to be better from the contemplation of such examples. Now, if beauty gives us cognitive access to certain important moral qualities, as some philosophers, uh, like Plato, seem to maintain, then we have a plausible mechanism for this kind of learning. So there's three reasons to be interested in the view. The principal argument for the view, nowadays anyway, is that it reflects our ordinary usage. We're apt to attribute aesthetic qualities to souls or characters, and these attributions are covalent with our moral attributions. Virtues are an aesthetic merits, and vices are an aesthetic demerits. Eventually, of course, a full vindication of the argument will require our thinking more about what an aesthetic experience of character would be like. And this is where I want to inject myself into the debate. What I have to say could be put as an objection to this view. Moral goodness, and indeed goodness generally, is too often too boring to be beautiful. I'll qualify this claim in a moment, but let me quickly make the initial case. Suppose that there are particular demands, aims, and ideals associated with morality. Now imagine that Stephanie lives up to these demands flawlessly. She has the right moral principles and pursues them with exactly the right attention and determination. She follows every moral rule, takes every opportunity to do what is supererogatory, avoids every transgression no matter how slight, and embodies every moral virtue. And she does all this for the most laudable reasons. Moreover, her good works are performed at significant personal sacrifice. And she became this way organically, not by being told what was right and good, but by discovering it through her own preternatural moral vision. She also, if you like, excels in quasi-moral domains like friendship and etiquette. What do we think of Stephanie? The moral beauty view would have us say that we should find her soul unsurpassingly beautiful. But I think we, I find her rather dull. It's related, but definitely different from a point Susan Wolfe makes about moral saints. The saint, Wolf says, will have to be very, very nice. 
and as a result may end up being dull-witted or humorless or bland. Now, Wolf's point seems to be more about how particular opportunities for mirth-making are incompatible with moral perfection because they might hurt feelings. But my point is more structural. It's that, as Somerset Mom says, perfection is a trifle dull. It's not just despite her many merits that she is dull, but because Stephanie is understood as the human embodiment of evaluative satisfaction that we imagine her to be flat or uninspiring. And I think our previous discussion affords us a useful diagnosis of this reaction, insofar as it's shared. Stephanie's life is like a painting by Lawrence Alma Tadema. It's skillful. It contains pleasing imagery. It's technically accomplished in the sense of satisfying central practical demands. But it's peculiarly lifeless. What do these reflections on Stephanie, her character, and her life have to do with the moral beauty view, though? If we say that true beauty can never be dull because it necessarily captivates, because it demands our attention, because it inspires not merely pleasure but love, if we say this, then Stephanie is a counterexample to the moral beauty view. But should we say this about beauty? I don't think facts about usage settle the question, but we can mark the ambiguity by making a distinction. So let's distinguish the beautiful from the pretty. This usage is stipulative, and what I call pretty will often be called beautiful, beautiful by perfectly competent speakers, but I hope that it has a little bit of traction in your minds. The experience of beauty is active, engaged, and feels compelled. The pleasure of beauty is a pleasure in this activity. The experience of prettiness, by contrast, is passive, receptive, supine. It luxuriates in pleasant sensations until they're gone. We might use magnificent, riveting, wondrous, or magnetic as near synonyms for beauty, and charming, delightful, or pleasing for prettiness. Beethoven's Grosse Fugue is beautiful but not pretty. Most of Rossini is the opposite. Matisse's Blue Nude in a lot of what we call modern art is beautiful but not pretty. Tiffany Glass is the opposite. Cezanne's paintings are beautiful. Alma Tadema's are pretty. What we call functional beauty is probably actually prettiness. Kant's Freie Schönheit is beauty. Hume's beauty is prettiness. Lots of things are both or neither, and there are sure to be disagreements about individual cases. If we adopt this distinction, though, then the beautiful cannot be boring, but the pretty can be. A well-mowed lawn can be pretty. A particular shade of blue can be pretty. This distinction allows us to hold on to our original thesis, albeit by a different name. That is, we can hold on to the moral prettiness view, according to which a quality of character is morally good just in case it's pretty. But that leaves the question of beauty. Can a person's character be beautiful in the sense that I've laid out here? I think it can be. The character that creates a life of genius, a character like Simone Weil's, can be beautiful in approximately the same way that a painting by Cezanne can be, not because it charms or pleases us, though it might, but because it enthralls us because spontaneity combined with the promise of intelligibility engages those mental faculties, the free and harmonious play of the imagination and understanding, if you're Kant, that are characteristic of aesthetic engagement. So what's the upshot of this conclusion? We have two qualities of character that correspond to two different aesthetic qualities. So what? Well, I think we could say something slightly more. Think back to why those interested in moral exemplars might also be interested in the moral beauty view. The moral powers suggested there are ones that it seems to me will reside with what I have called beauty and not with prettiness. Prettiness is too shallow and too ephemeral, for example, to motivate the sustained engagement with the purported exemplar necessary to enable real understanding of that person, real understanding and emulation of that person. So if what I have argued is right, and we're interested in the aesthetic dimension of moral exemplars, we will do well to look not just for your garden variety moral saints, many of whom may be quite dull, we should look for moral exemplars who are also ethical geniuses. Thanks. And I can fill any of my own questions. Uh, so this is a really thought-provoking talk. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much I agree with it completely, but it seems very, very plausible and well thought through. 
Um, I actually thought of your work when uh, when I read Zygzebski's uh, chapter, where she mentions the paradigms, and it, it occurred to me that unlike um, the sage, the saint, and the hero, that it would be an extraordinary challenge for any community or any sort of moral tradition that would regard uh, a genius as an example or try to imitate them to, to, to form, to develop. Because there's something about the exemplarity of the genius that um, seems to be at least in tension with uh, sustained communities or at least communities of a particular size. So I guess I was just wondering what your take on uh, the possibility of communities, however small, uh, forming around a common appreciation and or even emulation of particular geniuses. Is, is that like a oxymoron or what do you think about that? I think that that can definitely happen and probably has happened. I mean, so if you think that Jesus was an ethical genius, then there were significant communities that formed around admiration for and emulation of Jesus. Now, the members of those communities, insofar as they were engaged in a project of imitation to a certain extent, are not themselves geniuses. So if you have the view that somehow genius is something we should all strive for, then you might have problems of coordination where we're all kind of trying to forge out on our own against a backdrop of shared standards of intelligibility. But if we're all trying to do that, then that backdrop won't exist. So that tension is very real. Um, but certainly it's the case uh, with people I would regard as ethical geniuses. And definitely for artistic geniuses, there are people who you know, clearly were influenced by Cezanne, were sort of doing what Kant describes as far as like imitating Cezanne by following the rules that his art exemplifies, but are not themselves geniuses, and almost for that very reason. Um, so I think I agree with you, but, I, but, I, but not quite to the, the, yeah, the I letter. Yeah, I you put your finger on it, though. There just seems to be a gap, and, and I think an important gap in, in the possibility of emulation, where one of the central things that makes that exemplar exemplary is something that the people who form a community uh, in admiration of that exemplar really can't or, and, and shouldn't try to imitate, yeah. namely that sort of originality and, and all the things that you set out. Yeah, so if you wanted to moralize ethical genius and say, oh, this is something we should all strive for, instead of just what I'm doing here and other parts of the project sort of trying to describe it and say why it's valuable, then you would have problems about you know, how to um, work out exactly the problems you say. And it might be, we all get a little bit of genius. I didn't say that here explicitly, but I think these things are going to exist on a continuum. And there might be, it might make sense for us to create outlets for creativity that are significant and not sort of merely pro forma, um, but that might be the compromise we have to make. Thanks. Uh, um, so I, I want to push back a little against the idea that um, that virtuous is boring, which I recognize isn't quite. Mm -hmm. I, I'm working through the details of kind of how to make sense of this, but I'm thinking about someone who is a paradigm of virtue. What is it that's boring about a person like that? Um, the first person I think of is Jesus, but then I see we're, we're identifying him as a moral genius. Mm -hmm. Which says to me that maybe this, what we're identifying as, as the boring virt paradigm of virtue is something that is conforming to a set of rules that are current to the culture. Um, so there's nothing, um, nothing kind of new we're seeing about virtue from them. But I suppose one response I might have to that is to say, well, I'm not sure I want to say they're perfect mm -hmm. um, in virtue. So I, I'm wondering if part of the, the pretty moral distinction, or sort of pretty beautiful, <laughs> um, so pretty morality versus beautiful morality, um, actually has to do with, with our desire to see something that pushes against kind of sleepy, shallow virtue norms mm -hmm. that are current in a culture. Um, is this making sense? Yeah, and I think I agree with you. I'm glad you're pushing back in this way because I think this is exactly, this is a point where um, I think this is right to be pushed back against. I think what will happen is if you sort of name your favorite moral exemplar and say, yes, but 
they're not boring to me. Um, what you'll come to find is that they'll have some aspects of ethical genius. Yeah. They might not be full-fledged in, in, like in the terms that I've defined it, but you'll think that they're not just sort of, they, it's not that they discovered some battery of standards and they just adhere to it really, really well. You'll think that there's something uh, transcendent about what they're doing and whether it's a matter of moving past whatever the imminent uh, quasi-moral norms of their community are, or whether it's a matter of sort of refiguring the good in a way that no one's done before, there will be something that's sort of new under the sun with what they're doing. Yeah, do you want yeah. to give... Yeah, so, and this is just follow-up, because this makes me wonder then the degree to which whether or not something's boring is very, as a judge, very sensitive to context, right? So to go back to the art, um, you could have someone who was the first of an artistic movement and show show someone their piece of art. So I don't know if anyone would agree someone like Warhol is mm -hmm. a, um, an artistic genius. So you take some of that kind of pop art that we see in a way all over the place now and a lot of people here and now not recognizing what it was for him to introduce something new yeah. would say, well, that's not that interesting. That's like every, I see that kind of thing all the time, right? Um, so, so you have someone who evaluates a paradigm depending on where they are subjectively as boring versus as innovative. Right. So I think, yeah, um, sorry, what I'm thinking of right now, I feel like it's a slightly different issue, so I'll just say something about that. So I think there's a kind of tension here. Well, the way I defined genius, and then so uh, uh, concomitantly how I defined things downstream from it, was uh, community relative. It's like, this is new under the sun for us, given our ways of understanding things. So there's going to be a kind of relativism to it. Um, that's true. But I think, on the other hand, I'm motivated, and this is where like my Kantianism starts to show through a bit more. Part of this, this idea is supposed to be that there's going to be a kind of the beautiful things and things of genius, which are, for Kant are basically the same, um, well, when, they, when it comes to art. Um, are things that, well, he says, puts the imagination and understanding in free play. And that should be something that's not as clearly community relative. Um, but it's harder for me to understand how to articulate that, um, that notion uh, than it is to just say, well, this is new because we have these standard rules that we use to interpret it. So I agree, and I would like to find some way to think about um, originality that's not so um, community specific. Uh, so I, but I kind of took the coward's way out here by just saying, yeah, it is community specific. Uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you for your talk. It was super interesting. Um, what I want to press is um, sort of a, a disanalogy between um, genius in art and in morality. Um, so you might think that um, that art has a less has less of a requirement to social intelligibility. Um, while you were talking, I was remembering having read, uh, uh, so William Blake has these comments that he barbarously imposes onto uh, Reynolds' discourses um, and makes comments about like the sort of work that he sees himself as doing and he says things like, damned fool, genius is its own law. Genius has no error, it is ignorance that is an error. And he unbinds like genius, uh, he, he unbinds like his, his creative genius from having any sort of like reason requirement mm -hmm. um, to it. And I think uh, today like conceptual art is very similar in that um, like when you do your conceptual art, it's all in the mind and it doesn't even have a social intelligibility requirement because it's indifferent to like what it actually ends up being out in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, like along the same lines that um, so etymologically genius uh, is genus or, or source um, of something, and um, so I have conventional worries about like if you're considering yourself the source of your morality, um, that's incompatible with things like moral realism, which you know uh, it might be okay on, on like a, a Kantian read, but I have worries about that. Um, but I think a lot of this is like encamped in the um, understanding of like the historical understanding of the um, the artist and the philosopher. Or, perennial in this quarrel between one another and like Socrates is brought to court by the poets and they bring charges against them because they have different uh, commitments and understanding of what they're doing. So I just worry about that and the analogy between what the arts are committed to in their genius and what it might look like in a moral person. Good, thanks. That's really thought-provoking. Um, 
So I, to cut right to the heart of your question, I think I, I had some other reactions. But so I think that one, one thought you might have is that there are going to be certain requirements, practical requirements on life that are imposed somehow, and they're kind of non-negotiable. Maybe they're non-negotiable because they're just brute requirements of rationality. Maybe they're constitutive requirements of agency or something like that. And those things don't exist in art. Those constraints aren't there. You don't have to follow the rules. The constraints that are there are conventional, and they're, they're there to just be overthrown, whereas in, in practical reason, there are these fixed constraints. I'm, I'm OK with that. In fact, I think there are such constraints. Again, putting my cards on the table, I think that the, the categorical imperative is such a constraint. Um, but I think that you have the room for what I want to say as long as there is a gap between the particulars of how you lead your life and what is demanded by those constraints. So I think that there is a big gap between what's forbidden by the categorical imperative and then what you can do with yourself. So the question of how do I lead my life, given that I've decided to lead it morally according to Kantian ethics or whatever, actually leaves open a possibility for a great deal of innovation and creativity. Um, and in, in, in it may be narrower than the space of creativity and art, but it's still significant enough to have a phenomenon like genius, I think. Um, the thing about, um, the quote from Blake sounds very much like the romantic ideal. Um, the like, genius is just sort of out on its own. It's not um, subject to any rules at all. And yeah, there's uh, something to that. I'm fond of the like synthetic impulse in Kant to say, no, we can't just say that. It's not just wildness. Uh, we have to understand why we appreciate this art, why it's valuable, and to do that, we need to sort of understand how it has some meaning for us, even if it has a different meaning from artifacts or imitative art. Thanks. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, this is about the notion of spontaneity yeah. uh, that I thought you were working with as a kind of absence of rule guidedness. Um, so I was thinking about musical improvisation. Mm -hmm. Right, so it seems like a paradigm case of spontaneity. That's part of the reason why we're impressed. Uh, but then, for those who are trained, they, they can see, right? Oh, um, right, the musician is playing on a scale. Right, there really are rules that are being mm -hmm. uh, being followed here, though the untrained can't tell what they are. So I was wondering um, if you might go with a kind of disjunctive account of spontaneity, where it involves a departure from one set of rules for either uh, a course that's not rule governed or one that is is rule governed but sort of unexpected or something like that. So you unexpectedly switch from rules A to rules B? Yeah. Rules A might not have led, yeah. led the, the audience or whoever's taking it in to expect. Since the question is what, what whether the switch is governed by any rules. Um, if, I mean, I didn't want to completely identify spontaneity with, with rule governedness, um, though I can see why you understood me as, as wanting to do that. Um, so if, if we do make that identification, it's going to be a question of whether the switch is governed by any rules. And if it's not, if it is, then I'm like, oh, it's just persons following the like meta rules of this or whatever. The thing you're talking about with jazz, though, is very, very common. There are a lot of people who, I mean, so there's some critics of Cezanne who find the way Fry talks about Cezanne, that like there's this spontaneity that's ineliminable to be obscurantist and like just sort of like given up on doing real criticism. And like if you look hard enough, you can sort of see you can sort of describe everything in, you know, not rules exactly, but kind of rule-like principles. Um, so there's always that looming for any sort of um, particular example of spontaneity or genius to say like, oh, if you really looked harder, if you sifted through these things more, understood more about their background or where they're coming from, you can find and identify the rules. I'm sort of hoping um, that that doesn't happen for everyone, uh, that there will be these sort of genuine cases of spontaneity. Um, thanks. Yeah, I, I think there are some cases of moral genius where it doesn't involve sort of uh, coming up with a new rule, but rather simply taking an old rule and extending it uh, a bit further. I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, the classic Peter Singer expanding circle story where, you know, uh, recognition that um, human rights apply to, uh, to African Americans, that they apply to women, that 
uh, maybe we should ascribe rights to uh, to animals. Like there's, you know, you go through long periods in history where people just don't see that the rules that they're working with uh, actually have a much broader scope mm -hmm. that, um, than they realize. And then it takes like, a, you know, uh, it can take a moral genius um, to sort of see that uh, to see that following the rules that exist actually entails a, uh, a big change. Um, so I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't call those people moral genius, but I uh, but I feel like it sort of that tracks a really important kind of moral progress mm -hmm. is when you it is when you see uh, you know they, it, it's not like these people are inventing new <laughs> you know inventing new moral principles. They're just working with the same ones and yet sort of seeing it else uh, seeing it where no one else does. Yeah, I think I'm friendly to this suggestion. I would, I mean, I'm happy to say that people who do this are sort of, you know, maybe ethical demi geniuses. Um, they're 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 not they're not inventing novel ways of, of living, but there is a kind of invention. I mean, and I also think I can sort of fit that what you're describing into my rubric for describing these things just by saying, well, there's the rules we promulgate and the rules we're actually following. And for a long time, the rules we promulgated were uh, much wider and more universal than the rules we're actually following. And the innovation comes with the generalization and which might involve the sort of uh, noticing the discrepancy. Um, but generally, yeah. So I mean, I've tried to find the people who are most far along the spectrum. But there are certainly more of garden variety forms of practical invention and creativity that I think are part of the same genius. Genus. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs>